welcome to Ready to Scale. I'm Ellie Perlman, your host broadcasting from sunny California. When I'm not behind the mic, I buy multifamily properties with passive investors who partner with me on my deals. So Ready to Scale is our new second season here where we focus on the business side of real estate. So namely, we're going to talk about three key concepts that I like to call APS of real estate. So assets, process, and strategy. So by listening in, you would learn valuable business principles to help your real estate business thrive and diversify. If you enjoyed the podcast, please take a minute to rate us and don't forget to like and follow with me on my social media. So our guest today is Chris Salerno. So uh, Chris is a very, very young guy, very young investor who has been investing in multifamily for, uh, for a few years now. Um, he actually started at the age of 11 where he when he decided that he wanted to grow up and play Monopoly for real. So inspired by exposure to real estate brokering from his father, Chris now confesses that he would fake being sick just so he can tag along with his dad and, and go to all those meetings and learn from the wealth of wisdom of the businessman uh, in his uh, father's company. So that was not waste, wasted. And he's definitely, you know, taking all those lessons and implementing them today. So now actually Chris is 25, 24 years old. He's the founder and CEO of QC Capital. And prior to opening the company, he began his career as an agent and then a broker. Um, and then um, in, in his career, um, he generated over 140 million in real estate sales, which is very, very impressive for a 24 year old guy. Um, he is he, also, he's won several awards like uh, Charlotte's 30 Under 30, the Elite 50 Entrepreneurs, and he was nominated for Forbes 30 Under 30. So without further ado, I would like to welcome you to the show. Hey, Chris, how are you today? I'm doing amazing. It's a beautiful day in Charlotte, and I know California is beautiful right now. How are you? Yes, I'm, I'm doing great. I cannot really complain, as you know. <laughs> um, well, I think, your, Chris, your background is really interesting, especially given, you know, your age. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about kind of your background? And, and I, I, I told our listeners a little bit about it. So you basically grew up um, in a house where you had a, a father to look up to and yeah. pretty much learn a lot from it. So can you share with me a little bit of how it was to grow up there? Yeah. Um, so really, I always had the drive for opportunity. Um, and that's what we do in our business is we find great opportunity for our investors. So um, really at a very young age, I, um, I was intrigued with what money can buy. And I knew um, that money, the more money you had, the more people you can help. Um, so I knew at a very young age that I needed to accumulate as much money as possible so I can help more people. Um, so one of the aspects why I love real estate in general is that it's, it's always different. Um, if you drive through a neighborhood, um, unless it's a cookie cutter, you know, neighborhood that they build these days, they're all different. The homes are different styles. You walk in the home, it's different. People have different light fixtures. I mean, everything is different. And I never pictured myself sitting behind the desk doing the same thing over and over. I love being out and about. I love meeting new people and helping people. So that's really uh, the big reason why, I guess, at a very young age, I was so intrigued about real estate and how it operated that when I was in school, I tried to get out of school no matter what to work hard uh, because I know uh, when you they train you as an elementary, middle, and high that you have to go to college to be successful. Mm -hmm. that, that's the only route to be successful you have to go. Um, and I realized very quickly that that's not the route that you have to go. You really got to follow the passion, um, follow that work ethic and that drive. And um, and fortunately, I'm just I'm blessed that it's multifamily real estate that drives me to work even harder and to help people. So that sounds awesome. And I can definitely see your passion and your excitement. Did these I, 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 I get so say. excited. <laughs> <laughs> I just get so excited about it. Which is awesome. And so I, I think it's actually a good segue to start talking about the first part of um, all of our, our interview today about assets. So you um, assets, yeah. that you are investing in multifamily. What mm -hmm. drove you to multifamily? You know, especially at a young age, um, a lot of investors, they think, okay, I can start with maybe single family homes or maybe start small and then graduate from there to multifamily. 
what was kind of, if you can walk me through your kind of the, your, your thinking, the, your thought process, how, why did you decide to go to multifamily? Yeah, great question. So the reason why I decided to go to multifamily um, was a, a big thing is, is coming from the residential side. I do own some residential rentals and I've uh, created it where in six months I refinanced, got paid and it's still cash flows. But I realized really thinking on it, okay, well, if the market turns, what happens? Um, people may not rent residential, they may want to go to apartments, but I wanted the scalability. So I thought, okay, I have one tenant in one house. That's one in one. Um, if that tenant leaves, who pays the bills? I do. The tenant damages anything. Who pays everything? I do. Um, so then I, I looked in multifamily. And the reason why I really picked that type of asset class is back in 08 and 09, when we had that market correction, and I was actually uh, an hour ago speaking to my father about this, he presented an, an office building to me in Orlando and I said, no, I said, I don't do office. I don't do retail. I don't do industrial. I strictly stay with multifamily. And the reason why is my thought, pass, the thought process was back in 08 and 09 when the market shifted. Um, multifamily is a necessity. After you and I go to a restaurant and eat, where do we go? We go back to our home, our shelter. So it's a necessity. When it comes to retail, Amazon's taking a big hit or is putting a big hit on these retail and, um, and malls and shopping centers because I can order something and it'll come tomorrow. Um, and if I don't like it, I can send it back. So I really realized that retail, industrial, and office took a big hit back in 08, 09, 2010, but multifamily was still a very strong asset. And a big name that we all know in, in the industry here, a multifamily even said, he said, during 08 and 09, 2012, his businesses took a hit, but multifamily kept him afloat and kept his businesses afloat because it's a necessity. People need shelter. Um, so that's why I really picked the multifamily industry because it's a necessity. We need it as humans and it's not going away. You can't create Amazon to hurt retailers or hurt smaller businesses. Um, it's always going to be there. So that's why a, a big reason why I decided to go into the B and C value add of multifamily. Yeah, and I cannot agree more. It, that's um, part of the reason why I, I myself invest in multifamily is exactly this. It's a necessity. It's not. It's the last thing that that people would actually cut or you know let the, their budget be affected by it. So you go when you can't if you don't have enough money or as much as you had so you're not going to the fanciest restaurant that you used to go or to as many that they don't have to be fancy you buy you know fewer clothes and you're doing other things the house is the, the lot or the apartment that you rent that's kind of the last place where you actually want to make any amendment any change to your lifestyle um correct and so, so I, I, I completely, I also like the scalability. Uh, so there are a lot of other benefits of investing in multifamily. Um, and so your experience as a broker probably helped you a lot to get to where you are right now. And part of what you do today is finding off market deals. So I would love to hear from the strategy point of view, and this is, you know, we're kind of shifting um, to talk about the strategy. What, what's in your, um, I think it's pretty obvious, but I think it'll be, you know, interesting to hear from you, how making that change, that shift from, or using your connection as a broker, how is that helping you getting those, um, those, off-market deals, but actually maybe before this, the uh, answer in this question, I would say, you know, finding off-market deals is great. Everybody wants to find an off-market deal, right? Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's a great tool. It's a great strategy. And it's very clear why as a buyer, you would want to buy a, an off-market deal. Mm -hmm. um, what are the reasons for you? Why do you like off-market deals so much? Um, I like off-market deals is because one, it's better for our investors. Um, the numbers could definitely be a lot better for this particular deal um, that we recently acquired here in Charlotte. We, I was able to get it off market by relationships I built with the broker very quickly. Um, and the numbers are a little over 22% IRR for our investors. Wow. Um, so with that, the numbers are a lot better for our investors. And also it's, it's the hassle of going in best and final, waiting another month 
having final calls with the seller and the brokers, waiting another three weeks, and then getting awarded a deal or finding out if you know if you did not get awarded the deal. Um, so that's one reason why I like uh, really focusing on off markets. I know a lot of uh, a lot of operators. You know, they some may go direct to the seller or try to go direct. I, I don't have that philosophy. I like going direct to the broker and building relationships with the broker because I know when that bigger institutional um, firm wants to sell their portfolio, they're going to go to a broker. Um, or, you know, they may go to relationships they built or previous people that purchased their deals, but they're going to go to a broker to say, what are your top four people that you know that you can just put, present this to to see if they want it? Um, so, I've built great relationships with those brokers, which it definitely helps during off market. I just had one uh, text me today says we need to get lunch um, after Labor Day. Um, so I built that great relationships where they're asking me out to lunch, which I think that's, that's what a lot of people should do is build those relationships with those brokers because they know the deals, they know the market coming from that background of brokerage. I know their lingo. I know, you know, what to do and what to say to them. So when I, when I sold residential real estate and if you were my seller and I had 15 offers on the table, I'd present all 15 offers to you. And then I would say, look, I've, I've dealt with this individual before. They've closed deals with me before. I know they only deal with serious buyers. And you would go ahead and take my advice. And, and I would necessarily guide you to that best offer that best fits your needs. So that's how it is in the commercial world as well, is that they're going to say to that seller, listen, I've done a deal with them. It's been a very smooth closing. Um, no issues for our previous deals. I highly recommend this offer. Um, and then they're going to normally pick it. So that's why I always, uh, I really focus on uh, building the relationships with the brokers. Yeah. And I think that strategy is, is really good because the way that I see it, brokers, that's their, that, that's their full-time job. They're, they that's spend, their only thing. Yeah. Their entire their career thing. is spent exactly to find those owners, build relationships with them. And then if you're trying to find off market deals by going to owners yourself directly, you're competing with people who have been in the industry for tens of years. And I think that's kind of, you know, they have an advantage, obviously, not that it's impossible, but I think it's, it's a smarter way to do it this way. Um, and so somebody actually asked me recently, why would anyone sell a property off market? What, what would you say to that? Um, I think there's multiple different reasons. Um, I got presented um, a, a deal off market from a wholesaler and they're asking uh, like five million more than what they bought it for. So it may be a seller trying to, you know, ask top dollar for it and they know if they go to market that they may not necessarily get that price. Um, so there, I think there's multiple reasons when it comes to selling off market. It, uh, another reason that you have to think too is for on a, on a seller's point of view, they may not want to spend three weeks or I mean three months, three months, excuse me, one month to have viewings, another month to go into offers, another month to go into final invest. And then before you know it, they got to spend another two months. So you're at a half a year already before the property closes. Um, you know, a seller may just want to go straight direct to one person in one week, get everything done and close in another two months, two months. So, um, I, I see it from both angles. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's really interesting to see when, when time, when someone really wants to sell it and do it quickly, going through that traditional route of having it reviewed by the broker and, and open it up for a, a bid and war it, you might, I mean, as a seller, you might get, uh, you know, you probably will, will make more money doing that, but it's going to take you a lot longer. And there Correct. are other considerations. Sometimes they just, they want out because they're burnt out by, by managing the, the, the property. Sometimes their, their loan is due and they have to sell because they don't yeah. have any choice. So either way, yeah, there's still opportunities out there. Um, what is your, so, you know, in terms of the strategy, I think it's, you know, that was a good discussion about how, you know, why you chose to go and, and focus on off market deals. Um, I want to kind of shift our focus to the process itself. And you talked a little bit about it earlier when you said my, the, my, my actually the process of finding off market deals is to, to build strong relationships with brokers. 
And I think it's great when brokers are, you know, reaching out to you and texting you and asking you, you know, to lunch. They have right now, because right now multifamily is so popular and Correct. they're getting calls and emails from so many, so many potential buyers. What is your process of establishing those solid relationships? What are kind of the steps that you take? to make sure that you're the one who's being called when there's an off-market deal. I agree. The same process that I would do with any investor I have into our company. You have to treat a, an investor into our company exactly like a broker. You have to nurture them. You have to build their trust. Um, an investor wants to trust you and trust the deal as well when they invest in your company or in that deal. So it's the same thing is with a, is with a, um, a broker is that they want to trust you. They want to know because they get paid when the deal closes. So they want to trust that you're going to get this job done and you're going to close the deal so they can get a payday. Um, so I think the big thing is, is this nurturing them, you know, checking in on them. Hey, how are you? Um, I just, uh, the one that asked me about Labor Day, having, getting together after Labor Day, he just had a baby last Friday. Guess who messaged him personally and texted him right after I saw those pictures on Facebook, he had a baby. I did. So that right there separates myself from maybe one of these larger institutions or maybe these individuals who really are not trying to connect much with them that he's going to say, and he's going to know, I just had my first child and Chris Salerno texted me, congratulating me and saying, I'm going to need help in January because I have one coming in January. So I built that connection with them saying, please give me advice come January because you're going to be six months into it already. Um, so we, it, we laughed about that. And um, so that right there is we're, we're friends we're, we built those relationships and it, exactly like I would do with any investor this evening, I'm going out with another investor. I'm building those relationships with them and I'm building the relationships with the brokers. So I think it's, it's very important to come down and build the relationships um, and stay top of mind with important, uh, you know, life events like that to them staying top of mind with them when that first deal comes across their table, they're going to think of me because I've reached out to them on an important, important life event. They're going to come to me and say, look, I got a deal here. I know you can close it. Do you like it or not? Um, so I, I find that very helpful. Absolutely. I think it's, uh, I think it's a, a great idea to do it and um, to do it this way to actually see them like you see any other investor or any other business partner, business associate that you want to create those relationships with. Um, and, and so the way that you do it when you're actually putting time and effort into really wanting to connect with them, I'm assuming that that takes time. How yes. do you choose who to focus your time and energy with? Because, you know, in some markets you can have tens of brokers. How do you know which one is quote unquote worth at the time? Yeah, very, great question. So um, here in the Carolinas, um, you, you have, you know, big institutions, Cushman and Wakefield, Marcus and Millichap. Um, I've really narrowed down just like how um, any business would narrow down their leads. Um, as like a funnel. So I narrowed down what is the top producer in the Carolinas who manages and who really gets all that insight when it comes to multifamily. I've narrowed that company down and then I narrowed those individuals down with that company where I know them. Um, I've texted them. I have just like I would follow up with an investor and connect with an investor on a weekly basis on a weekly basis. I do that with the brokers as well um, because you, you have to nurture them. Um, but it, it comes down to who is known in the market, um, who really deals with the, the majority of the multifamily transactions. Um, and I created like a funnel. So the mom and pop brokerage, I still reach out to them because they may find, you may find a golden nugget. You never know. Um, I don't brokerage real estate at all. But I do have my broker's license that is on referral status, so I have MLS access because once a year you'll get a residential agent thinking they know multifamily and post a 130 unit on the MLS, which no one will look at because it's all residential, but I set myself up on a search, so if it comes up, boom, I know it, and then now I can go ahead and get it. Um, so I think it, I've narrowed it down by who really mess, who really deals and works in that multifamily space at a very high level. And then the funnel goes down to the mom and pops, but I make sure I try to contact them all the time. Consistency is key with follow-up. 
Um, I know a lot of people and my main uh, very heavy investor who's invested very heavily with us, um, it took me, I, I, I sold residential real estate and he was looking in the residential to buy single family condos um, to rent out. And it took me eight months before I even got in contact with him um, for residential real estate. But then when I started transitioning into multifamily, I opened his eyes up to a whole new world. And then he invested 500,000 within three, three months um, wow. of uh, us opening up everything. And he's in love with the multifamily industry now compared to that residential industry. So he will not dabble in residential. He will only dabble in multifamily. So, um, but if, if, I gave up during that eight month time frame. my company would not have been where it is today because of him. So that's a big thing is never giving up, staying consistent and following up. Absolutely. And I think it's also what separates you from others because most, or I, I don't want to say most, but many professionals, they don't have that system. It's, it's random. Whenever they reach out, they reach out and it's really hard to keep, you know, to keep you in someone's, you know, mind when you're Correct. not making those consistent follow-ups. Um, so do you, do you use any tools or any softwares that help, you know, help you keep uh, everything on track so you can stay consistent? Yeah, great question. So um, at first I was using nothing and I, I pour a lot into my mind where it will just say, okay, I need to contact this person because I haven't spoken to him in a while. Um, but I've used a, a calend, uh, it's Calendly, um, that system that has helped tremendously to set up um, and have calls. Uh, today I had like 15 to 20 calls um, and like two other podcasts. So I had to set it all up in there to make sure my schedule and my time management is perfect. Um, and then I just signed up with, it, uh, is it contactually? Um, that's what I just signed up with. And that has been an extreme help with following up, uh, with people, with following up with all my clients, um, and brokers. So I've been using that at a very high level and not just, um, a lot of people in this business will just, you know, maybe gear towards investors, but everyone's an investor if you see it. So I follow up with family, with friends, everyone, because everyone is an investor. And if they may not be an investor, they may know of an investor. Right. So it's always to stay top of mind. I know a hundred percent you shop on Amazon and I do too. Yeah. And <laughs> I get, I get emails left and right of, Oh, we're recommending this to you or we're recommending this to you. Oh, you just bought this book. So maybe you want this book. So they're trying to stay top of mind and I don't go to the bookstore anymore. I go straight to Amazon. Mm -hmm. Um, I went to go buy a new light for my production and I went to Best Buy, could not find it. Um, so I went on Amazon while I was in Best Buy. I found it, but cheaper than all the other lights in there. And it was coming the next day. So I said, boom, that's being top of mind. So with these systems has definitely helped me be top of mind for family, for friends, for investors, for brokers, um, and to reach out to them all the time. Um, and reaching out to them on all social media platforms, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, I'm very heavily on all of them. And I think uh, for an individual, it's good to be, be exposed on them because we talked before this, you went surfing. Yeah. I knew you went surfing and I asked you about it because you were top of mind when I saw you on Facebook. So, um, that's the uh, Facebook is another way to stay top on mine and to get out there. I have all the brokers and everybody on all my LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram, and I'm staying top of mind because I'm posting educational content on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So they're going to stay top of mind when they think of Charlotte, North Carolina for investing. I get a ton of people that reach out to me and just says, yeah, you were referred to me by so-and-so because they know you live in Charlotte and you know that market. So that's fantastic. That was a fantastic summary of how I know it's long. <laughs> no, no, it was fantastic because I, I'm also using contactually and I'm also using social media. So, um, yeah. you know, and, and staying consistent is really, really key and it's hard to do. So, you know, over time I do have people on my team that help me do that, but it's definitely the human, the personal element. That's what separates you. That's what makes correct you different than others. Well, I, I, Go ahead. You want to say something? Yeah. So lately, um, I, I've hired through Upwork to reach out to some of my LinkedIn contacts because it's all about leverage in this business. And what they would do is I gave them one template and that was just the initial contact. 
um, because I knew that template would work and they would reach out to everyone in a private group that I told them to and then all my co connections. And then all, uh, once they send that first template, any response I take from there because it's that initial contact. I want to build that relationship with you. Right. Like you went surfing. I, I wake surf here in Charlotte and I snowboard and we build that contact. So it's all about building that, that relationship. Um, because this is a long term game. Um, I'll be in this the next hundred years. So it's, it's long term. And one thing I wanted to touch on, if a broker brought me a deal and they said, well, Chris, I want you to pay the 3%, I'll pay it because I'm in this game for long term. Mm -hmm. I'm not in this game to make a short dollar, you know, right then and there. Right. Investors want this for long-term benefits. So um, that's, a, that's a big thing when it comes to follow up and staying consistent. You want to follow up and get to know their family, you know, go out with them if you can and um, spend family time with them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Chris, so much for sharing well, that with us. That, that was fantastic. Yeah. And we're, we're definitely using very similar platforms right there. Um, so Chris, if, uh, anybody wants to get in touch with you, I'm sure you can be found very easily on social media, but yes. where can they find you? Um, Instagram, you can find me at Chris underscore Salerno underscore. Um, I would highly recommend everyone just go straight to my website at Chris at Q, or I mean, um, QC capital group.com and then go ahead and just subscribe to the newsletter and then we can set up a call to chat. That would be the easiest way, um, to get direct contact with me. All right. Perfect. Chris, thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Looking forward to the next one.